2008 to 2012, the golden era of mega church celebrity culture, the explosion of social media, catapulting local pastors into international fame, the boom of the reformed and restless movement, the explosion of technology decentralized how information got out there, allowing every camp within Christendom to get their messaging out there, which may have indirectly galvanized their tribes to call everyone outside of their camp a false teacher. False teachers. And because of all this explosion, many of these pastors were positioned to be enemies of each other. Until the elephant room was created, bringing celebrity pastors from different camps into the same room to settle the debate once and for all. That, that, that's goofy. Bruce Lawn. Elephant room debate, one of the most interesting things I've ever seen between pastors in Christendom. I think it'd be amazing to bring it back. I am going to be potentially doing a series on this, depending on how this video goes and revisiting some of this, because a lot of you guys got saved maybe within the last 10 years. You totally missed this entire era that was so groundbreaking in a lot of mega church and technology church overlap, which kind of led to what I'm doing here now with YouTube. So today's video, Stephen Furtick, Matt Chandler, you guys saw my breakdown of the sermon in the Code Orange Revival. This is what happened before. Now, if you're looking just for this video, that's not what this is. Go look at just the video. If you're here, you want to hear my reaction and commentary on this video and actually sharing some of the many ways that in hindsight, I overlapped with some of Furtick's views at the time and figuring out if the views always had some critical errors or if he drifted as the church exploded and he became more insulated. Here is the opening question. Should the Sunday morning experience be designed for the non-believer or the believer. I make the case that that's the purpose of the weekend service. I mean, we're talking in a larger way about what the mission of Jesus was to seek and save that which is lost, Luke 1910. And then also that Jesus came not for the healthy, but for the sick. And so we take something broad like that and then we narrow it down to say, what is the weekend worship experience for? But I can't isolate that out because I teach my church that our mission is to not only to reach lost people, but to exist for the world, right? Our so he's saying, hey, our church exists for the world to reach people far from God. Why? Because that was Jesus's mission in his ministry. So the Sunday morning church should reflect that. The church should serve that. We can accomplish the mission of Jesus in the earth. And I take a statement like that that everyone agrees on. And then I say our weekend worship is going to, in large part, and really primarily have a hyper focus for that purpose. Preaching to build attendees versus preaching to build attendees. And people start bringing um, this, this, this paradigm to bear that that now I'm not preaching the word. I'm not feeding the flock. Based on this evangelism first, then the critique of me becomes, well, you're not preaching the word enough. Okay, interesting. Listen to Chandler preach every chance I get. And I hear a guy who's trying to teach. You guys think he was really listening to Chandler preach every chance he got, or you think that was cap? Church that we should be about mission. We should be about others. We don't exist for ourselves as individuals or as a body. And we're not here to entertain you. And that's the same thing I'm saying to my church when I say, we exist to reach people far from God. We exist to reach lost people. And so, for instance, right now I'm preaching through the book of Ephesians. I'm doing a walkthrough of Ephesians. And I'm tying it in with certain things from the Old Testament about the promised land. And I'm equating the spiritual promises, you know, Ephesians 1, 3, every yeah. spiritual blessing in Christ to the, the promised land that God gave to his people in the Old Testament. And so I'm preparing a sermon on eight verses from Ephesians this week. And I think... By the way, that passage was the same passage that, that uh, Matt Chandler incorporated when he went and preached that Code Orange Revival. This is so bizarre watching this in hindsight. <laughs> and it is a caricature. And to get up here and say, okay, Chandler represents building the attendees. Furtick represents building the attendance. Of course you want to be on the side of that that's about building people. My whole life, my whole ministry about is about building people. I don't know about that. I think, you, I, no, I, I think, I'm not sure that I would just be like, oh, well, I want to be about building people. Everyone agrees. I think what you're doing is amazing. I mean, you've had 10,000 people profess faith in Christ in your church in five years. I don't think there's nobody can touch that, all right? Yeah. The baptism is full every single week. You are reaching people far from God, and I don't think you should have to just sort of say, well, you know, I mean, you went to, people don't know. You went to Southern Seminary. You can handle the word. There's no question yeah, about yeah. that. So the verdict did go to a conservative seminary, Southern Seminary, which is important to note. The second part that's important to note is he talked about the baptism pool being always pool. 
after this, it came out that Elevation had this really questionable practice of spontaneous baptisms in the same way they would put auxiliary preachers on the stage to engage the preacher and get hyped up, which, by the way, I think we should be excited for the word, but they would kind of place people in specific places and encourage them to preach along and amen the pastor. They also did this bizarre thing of spontaneous baptisms where they would have leaders and people that were already baptized, and when they would offer the opportunity to get baptized— stage people to go to the front. This was a massive scandal a couple years. Well, a scandal. It was a massive thing that came out a couple years after that. So that, that, that's where you go. You know, how, how much of that is is actual people that never knew Jesus placing their faith in Jesus versus how many people that maybe were already churchgoers and maybe they had a, a moment to respond and that, right? And it's not the question, all that kind of stuff, but it, it, there is some distinction there with regards to how this is being framed. The baptismal pool is always, well, you could do stuff to kind of manipulate and finesse those numbers a little bit. And you guys could Google that on your own, the spontaneous baptisms that came out. There's emails and all kinds of weird things that, uh, that leaked after the fact. All right, let's keep watching. But your contribution is people far from God. Right. And you're like, you're like fired up about that. People far from God. So you make it attendance and then you depersonalize it. Yeah. You just want to draw a crowd. And that now, this is a good point. Right? People far from God, but you make it about attendance and you depersonalize. That's a good point on Driscoll's part. What a lot of guys who are very evangelistically passionate get pigeonholed into is you just want your seats full. And so people say dumb stuff about, well, you know, if I wanted to draw a crowd, I'd start a fight in the Target parking lot and that'll draw a crowd so right. a crowd doesn't measure anything. Yeah. And so if you, if you. And the ironic part is both of these guys are mega church pastors. Chandler's a mega church pastor, right? Driscoll's a mega church pastor. Everybody here is a mega church pastor, regardless on if they preach through the Bible verse by verse in the year, if they do topical messages, if they are designed to reach people far from God, if they're there to feed the flock, all these guys are mega church pastors. So that's a goofy critique to say, well, if someone is getting a big crowd, it's because they're not preaching right, right? Eh, I don't know about that one. I think that's, a, and, and again, I think Ferdicare makes some good points. By the way, a mega church is classified as 2,000 or more people. for people any of us with a good heart everybody you've invited here today we're in this for people my, my contention is that without a hyper focus on reaching people far from god staying on mission our church turns into this feed me bless me if you can club and none of us want to pastor churches like that chandler is the strongest i've ever heard about rebuking that mindset in his own church right so you know my time's up all right sweet okay um okay so here is his response matt chandler's response to all this what i've seen and my fear with this evangelism first type of mindset is um, really, I'd go back to Jesus and in Matthew 13 parable of the sower, right? He, he throws out the seed. This is what the kingdom of God is like. And, and that some of that seed falls on good soil. And, but some of that seed falls on, on rocky soil and, and it sprouts up, it receives it, it loves it. But then as soon as it's not convenient, it's gone. Yeah. And, and so my fear, I mean, I guess an illustration would be um, a baby breastfeeding is cute. A 20 year old breastfeeding is disturbing. Um, disturbing. One's legal and one's illegal, right? Right. right. And, and so, and, and, and well, I guess that, that never mind. I, that, that was filter caught that. Thank God. Um, and, and so in, in the end, my fear of this evangelism first mindset is that you've got a 40 year old man breastfeeding playing, playing in the kiddie pool who knows nothing of the ocean, nothing of the depths. And, and I've seen um, life just kick people in the soul uh, who haven't developed really the depth uh, of knowledge in regards to the character of God and who God is. Yeah. And, and so that my fear is when it's evangelism only, our, our goal here, our job here is evangelism only, is that um, you're in the end, if you're for people, you're not doing them a service, it's going to go bad. And that if you, you it, to, to further the caricature, it almost becomes, do you wanna reach people or do you wanna be doctrinal? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, here is where the character is being designed in terms of the, the binary here, which again, I'm gonna share some of my thoughts towards the end of this. But you want to reach people, you want to be doctrinal. Chandler's point is, hey, if you aren't teaching people about the depth and not the depth, the depth of, of God isn't just head knowledge. I think there needs to be an acknowledgement of things like sin, hell, repentance, suffering, tribulation, trial, right? If you don't pre-warn baby Christians about this, and it's just all about God loves you, God cares for you, he has a purpose for you, but they're never equipped to understand that Jesus told us there will be trouble in this life. I think that is, and, and what Chandler's saying is it can be detrimental to the development of a follower of Jesus because there will be trouble in this life. That That is what he's getting at, and I would agree with him. 
church do you want to be? Like you have to choose one of those. And so I, you're in you're in Ephesians. I mean, Ephesus is the church to look at. Ephesus is founded in Acts 20. This is our time, Matt, be like taking Furtick's points and like flipping it on them. Nobody's seen anything like Ephesus, right? Um, a riot starts. It, Paul says after two years, no one in Asia had not heard the, the gospel. Mega and church, day one. Blew it up. Now, um, in, in that. So again, it's not that mega churches are bad. That's not what we're saying here. Um, he comes back uh, after this riot because people who were making money off of um, sinful gain couldn't make money anymore. Um, he, he comes back and he tells the Ephesian elders, look, I'm, you're not going to see me again. I got to go die. Um, but just know this. Fierce wolves are coming. Um, ferocious wolves are coming, and some of you are those wolves. Mm. And, and then if you go to the book of Ephesus, I mean, you're, you're preaching through Ephesians right now, Ephesians 1 through 3, who the, who the believer is in Christ, uh, you know, Ephesians 3 through 6, the, the behavior of the believer in Christ, all right, very Pauline, you know, gospel first, then how that gospel flexes itself out. Then if you go to First and Second Timothy, so Timothy, who is now uh, the elder in Ephesus. So it's always, and I love that he pointed that out, because because when you read a lot of Paul's letters, what, what he's saying is, is theology of the gospel and then intodoxology of how we are to live onto the glory of God. It's a lot of these verses. So, so Ephesians is structured like that as well, which is, which is beautiful from a literary standpoint and beautiful from a, hey, l let's get a, a, a vertical focus on Jesus and God and the gospel and what he's done for us. And then, hey, this is how this is going to flesh out. And here are some of my answers to some of your questions. Because remember, a lot of the New Testament epistles were letters written in response to questions and struggles that local churches were having is being told by Paul, guard your doctrine, watch your doctrine, doctrine, preach the word of God faithfully. Doctrine just means belief and study. It sounds like a big word. Theology sounds like a big word. Theology means study of God. Doctrine just means your beliefs and the, the, the essentials of what you're framing around, right? So don't, don't be intimidated with these words. Um, Paul even says to the Ephesian elders, I, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. I am innocent of your blood in any way, but you're going to watch the, you're going to watch. Is that my time or a minute? Yeah, no, that's your, okay, that's you, minute. you're going to watch, um, you, you're going to watch in the end, um, Furtick looks confused. Hold on, why Furtick looks like? Wait, wait, he went over his time. That's not fair. Let me pull this back. I don't know if you guys caught this. The Ephesian elders, I, I preach to you the whole counsel of God. I am innocent of your blood in any way, but you're gonna watch. The you're gonna watch. Is that my time or a minute? Look at what is it? What is this here? Look, watch this. Oh, that's your, okay, that's you, you're gonna watch. Um, you, you're gonna watch in the. End. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Um, Ephesus died in, in Revelation chapter 2. So you've got this constant... Chandler said, what clock? <laughs> keep going, baby. <laughs> ...clamoring on Paul to Timothy, on Paul to the Ephesian elders, Paul to the church at Ephesus to grow deeper in their understanding of who God is, of how God operates, of these really kind of cosmic level ideas. And, you know, Ephesians chapter 1, I mean, it's, I mean, it's dense. Uh, it's extreme. He's, yo, he is a good 30 seconds over his time limit. Or is that the minutes? And right. and so. Oh no, no, he did go over his time. That, I'm tripping. That, that's where some of my problem lies. Furtick was just confused. This evangelism first is it tends to isolate depth and view depth as the enemy of conversion, and it tends to isolate depth and view depth as the enemy of conversion. This is a gym, all right. That's that's a bar. Simply not true. Mm. So you end up with, like I said, a 40 year old you know, breastfeeding and, and playing in the kiddie pool. And that's just sad. I've heard you teach. You're just filling people's heads with a lot of Bible knowledge, just Bible fat heads, just like, I know so much about God. And that <laughs> knowledge pops up. That's what I think Absolutely. you're doing. And I don't think you care about content at all. I think all you want to do is just reach the person far from God. And I don't think you really appreciate what he said at all. Yeah. So <laughs> Bible fat heads is a bar for sure. And really, because I have the privilege of knowing you, I just think they don't get it at all. Yes. Yeah. It's wild how relevant this discussion is for today, is it not? Especially in light of this stuff, a lot of the stuff that's happening on in the YouTube Christian stratosphere. This stuff is more relevant than ever. Would you agree? Oh, 100%. 1,000%. And I, I think you always talk about, too, in a lot of uh, videos you've done about legalism. And you've used those characters, almost the Bible fathead or the person that doesn't care about the knowledge. But it, it is super relevant because... Like, we have so much to talk about when it comes to those two topics. To say that by leading my church in a way that is missionally and evangelistically focused produces a 19-year-old on the 19-year-old uh, who hasn't grown up yet. There's, there's this verse in Philemon. I pray that you may be active and sharing your faith sure. so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. If an evangelism first church was me standing up every week and only presenting how to be saved, how to come to Christ, for 45 minutes and there was no there was no progressive teaching or there was no prayerful study of how are we going to communicate God's word you know I, I I planned out my sermons and and I've done this now for so you see what he did there you see what he did here he created a caricature of the argument if 
what I'm supposed to do is just tell people how to be saved. At the time, this is again, this is over 10 years ago. At the time, it sounded like the discussion was about what is Sunday morning church for? And and some of the questions within Ferdig's communication style wasn't some of the kind of off the wall stuff he said now and hasn't cleaned up or apologized for, right? Like I am God almighty and all these other kind of bizarre things he said recently that are really skewing into maybe parts of modalism, maybe some prosperity stuff. The, at the time, the critique against Ferdig was, hey, you don't talk about repentance, sin, or hell. You talk, you, you actually do preach from the Bible and he was preaching from the the Bible and he was preaching, uh, uh, you know, stuff that is is more on the theologically sound spectrum back then than it is now. But he takes it and he kind of flips it into this. Well, what am I supposed to do? Just t- tell people how to be saved every Sunday morning? And that's that. That's actually not what's being discussed here right now. The entire five years of the church with a 12 to 18 month out view that doesn't start with what would be cool and what would create buzz and what would create hype. So so he says, oh, and then he pivots. He says, well, if I just told people how to be saved, oh, by the way, and that's not even how we structure our messages. We don't think about what's cool, what would build buzz, what would build hype. We actually really thoughtfully and prayerfully plan out what we're going to talk about, which I'm sure he does. Very seriously about what to feed the church. However, when I'm presenting to our church why we exist and why we do this, if I don't constantly stand up there and say, this is not about us. This is not about simply collecting more knowledge. This isn't simply about looking in a mirror, going away, forgetting what we look like. Jesus said, you know. It's a nice little reference. I believe that's James there. Uh, uh, what is it, Seven. Oh, uh, everyone who comes to me and hears these yeah. words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, okay? So I'm trying to create a church that doesn't just hear the word. I'm trying to create a church that does the word. And in that focus on reaching people far from God, the content of everything that I preach is going to grow a believer. That's the whole purpose. But the greatest growth of a believer is when they get outside of themselves and they realize this isn't about me. The most spiritually mature churches are the ones where the people aren't coming in asking what 47 Bible studies do you have for me, but what can we give to the world? How can we offer ourselves as living sacrifices? That's the kind of culture I'm trying to create, a culture where people are so mature that it's not about them, a culture where it's so mature that they have grown and developed in their knowledge of God's mission, God's character, and the Word. Which is, I think every pastor would say amen to that. Right. I don't. So it's like this is like sleight of hand he did there, you know, and I think everybody would like a- amen to that. But I, I think we might be he may be missing with some of the, the, the like the critique is. Well, give me a thumbs up, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nobody's saying amen. I can't get nothing out of you. You're supposed to be boys. You come up in the show. That ain't right. They don't help you out. Yeah, boys need to south. wake up, man. Your turn's coming. <laughs> somebody thumbs up somebody. All right. Your time's done. You're, you're on. Here. Okay. Jesus. Um, Hallelujah. <laughs> he needed the validation. <laughs> But here would be my, like, I guess, so you kind of blow up on the scene. And and so I didn't know a lot. So now, 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 Zach, now he gets good. Now we start getting to the root of the beef. Buckle up. Here it goes. Y'all, I'm here in Ferdick. We talked on the phone years ago, right? You, I mean, you had just opened the door, like 6,000 people came that weekend. All right, I don't know where, no mailers, no nothing, just Holy Spirit drew them in. And and so we talked, and then we had one backstage kind of chit-chat at Catalyst. Yeah. And and then um, and then all of a sudden you're everywhere, man. I mean, Rick Warren's, you know, having you, you know, do the intro to his new book or whatever, having you at his house, you know. Um, Mark, you been to Rick Warren's sure. house? I've been to his office. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying right there. <laughs> Rick's probably been to his This is where you start getting to, to kind of the meat of, of some of their issues. Like, here's a legitimate concern. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Googling you. I, I just want to know what you're about. They're, the Reformed community is not a big fan, uh, to be straight with you. Not a big fan of, of you. Of anything. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> the Reformed community is not a big fan of anything. Driscoll, man. Driscoll, Driscoll was coming in hot back then. And uh, and I, even though he was one of the faces of the Reformed Resident community, he would, he still would would, 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 uh, would sound off jokes and stuff, which I thought was funny. We love Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> we love Calvin. So... So, so wait, wait, and, uh, <laughs> so, so I come across this video of you, and, and granted, I, I know I, I don't want to be judged by things I've said 10 years ago or whatever, yeah. but, but of you rebuking your crowd for wanting depth, and, and your defense of that yeah. was that we've seen a thousand people saved here. So from your own mouth, and the pulpit drives the church. Yeah. I mean, people can say whatever they want, but right. the pulpit drives the church. Y- you're in front of your congregation saying, you know, you guys want to talk about reform, you guys want to talk about this doctrine, yeah, yeah, this yeah. doctrine, this doctrine. Yeah. Well, I want you to know we baptize a thousand people. You can go somewhere else for that, and everybody cheers, and I'm hard broken going you just did it bro you, you literally just said evangelism and doctrine yeah. are are exclusive yeah here's the now here is the root of the critique here is the root of the tension right here evangelism and doctrine are exclusive they open with this like is the church for believers or not believers and but the real issue these two have is this issue 
And yeah. and so that's the kind of thing for me that I look at that and I'm going, oh, Stephen. You watched the whole sermon or the? No, that's what I'm saying, and that's what I'm saying. It's unfair because you you judge by sound bites, right? Yeah, so that's what I saw. Well, the whole sermon was online. You should watch the whole thing. It was pretty excellent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> With the jab back. I'm in Charlotte. Our cities are very similar. We have a lot of people church on every corner. Form of godliness, deny the power, power thereof. God. Dead, dry religion. Ezekiel 37, Valley of Dry Bones. We're dealing with a lot of that. And so, to be, and you know this very well, sometimes I have to be hyperbolic. And sure. I watched that clip too. And man, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. It was. I remember it was actually the third service of the day, and the tone was off, and was very angry. However, I like it, angry. It does make me angry to think about how many people are cycling through my church as one out of four churches that they attend. You know, they go to this one because they like the children's ministry, this one because sure. their friends go the there, this one because the worship's hot. Yeah. And so sometimes, yes, there is, a, there is a hyperbolic sense in which I will say, if all you want to do is go deeper, and what you mean by deeper is, give me abstract theoretical truth that is so lofty and so disconnected that I don't have to do anything about it, just confuse the heck out of me so that I won't have to go home and treat my wife any better or so that I won't have to step across the street and reach my neighbors. Yes, I'm going to exaggerate my point to say, get out of here if that's what you want. And that was the context yeah. of that. Now, listen to what he says. He says, if you just define deeper as give me an abstract theological truth that I don't have to do anything about it, well, then, you know, get out of here. That's not what this is for. And, and so I, th I think... I think there are people, there are quote unquote biblical uh, fatheads that do desire just abstract knowledge about the book of Leviticus that, that isn't going to force them to love neighbor, love wife, do anything better. I don't think that's everyone's heart though. And I think maybe Fardik missed it here that I don't think people were saying, just give me abstract stuff I don't have to do anything with. I think Fardik was saying, hey, maybe equip me to know what, what to do when trouble does come. Maybe equip me to know how to process suffering. Maybe equip me to know how to rely on the character of God when things don't go my way, right? So I think the way he defines this is, I don't know if it's, it's, if, if, if it's the most authentic what most people do. Now, I'm personally not a fan of folks who just want the, the lofty theology of abstract concepts that don't really have any implication. I, I don't like talking about that stuff. I think at the end of the day, uh, great theology should look like your life looking different and being transformed and looking different in the world, right? That That is the whole point of good doctrine is it should change you and transform you. So I, I think, I don't know if Furtick's kind of misunderstanding here. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's happening, but I think he makes a good point. And there definitely were and are, and I'm going to tell a personal story about this, how, how probably why I'm <laughs> I was scarred by the reform community back then um, that, that I think may help make make sense of, of some of my views on this. But let's let's just keep watching in the sermon. But you don't see the rest of that in the five minute clip. Also to that, let me say one more thing. There is for me, um, uh, there's something I heard you say one time, I think maybe at Desiring God. And I was up. This was right before I called you the last time that I called you. And you're so kind to listen to my feedback. Um, you rebuked me several times. Well, I called him Once. because I was think about think about the irony here. That verdict is calling Matt Chandler and re giving him feedback on his sermons. Yet Furtick is arguably one of the most insulated people <laughs> in all of modern Christendom. Like the irony of like, I call Chandler and give him feedback on his, and like, and like no one can get near you to give you any sort of reasonable feedback. And when you blunder and fumble and say terrible things like I am God Almighty, there's no humility to try and go and correct these things. Right now, I get, extend the grace. Maybe he misspoke. Maybe he doesn't believe he's God Almighty. But to not clean that up is like, bro, Bro, like, are you that detached from any reasonable human that's going to be like, ah, you shouldn't have said that. You need to apologize. At least throw something up on your Instagram story. Nope, I'm just going to just keep it pushing, right? Like, ah, this is so ironic. Listening to this thing, and you were, you were talking about um, the nightmare that is Dallas, and you said, here's what I'm dealing with. And the crowd went nuts. This was total red meat for that particular crowd. So you go, um, in Dallas, I've got pastors who say, I'm going to preach on debt for four weeks. Hey, worship guy, write me a song. And so the worship guy writes a song, Debt is Dumb. And then the pastor gets up and says, Debt is Dumb. And, then he, and, and, and the crowd's rolling, and it's hysterical. And at the end of it, you say, Why not better? And then you deliver some zinger line that just communicates the essence of the gospel in, in two sentences. And, and, and the crowd goes nuts. And of course your way is better. You know, I've never been in a creative meeting that had anything in common with what you described and what that does to guys 
who are trying to preach in practical ways and reach people far from God is it makes us look like we're sitting around with no brains and we're not. We're praying, we're seeking God, we're fasting. I led my church through the New Testament in 30 days, new through 30. We just uh, finished a, a fast to begin our, our sixth year of ministry. The, and when we fasted for 11 days together and we seek God and we seek God deeply. And I just don't appreciate the kind of rhetoric that's easy to get a crowd fired up about any more than you would to me, for me to separate evangelism and doctrine when we're just sitting around in a creative room thinking of ridiculous stuff and nothing is taken into account that we really do care about God's word and reaching people. We're getting on the side of Furtick where he feels like here's some offense on his part. So Shannon's like, bro, you did it. You said depth and doctrine and, and you know, you, you, you did the very thing we're talking about in that message. Furtick goes, ah, yeah, I was off. And then Furtick flips it on him and says, man, you made fun of us saying we sit around in a meeting and, uh, you know, worship guy wrote me, write me a song, Dead is Dumb, about a song to do a four week series on Dead is Dumb. Now here's my experience. And this is just my experience because I want to project this on all of reform people. But my experience was this. Our church went through a phase of being uber duper reformed. And I'm talking like the pastor at the time literally just took Driscoll's uh, doc, uh, doctrines, doctrine book and just redid it, rewrote it, made his own version of it, basically. And we did a 12-week thing. We went through it as a church. We signed a covenant for membership. It was a whole deal. And I remember at the time, this is 2011-ish, me and my wife, who come from poverty, broke, broken families, not doing well, out of college, struggling. We were in a ton of debt. And that's tying this into this idea of debt. And I remember us getting on the Dave Ramsey plan. Right now, I'm not, I'm not co-sign everything Dave Ramsey has ever said and done. So just, just miss me with that, right? But I remember um, the breakthroughs we were having and how awesome it was. And the fact that like our marriage was more stable, the fact that there was momentum, the fact that there was like a direct uh, future to our careers, to not having to live hand to mouth, to learning how to manage our money. And, and if we were, I mean, they say that most people who get out of debt, that you end up getting, um, you end up losing weight and getting in better shape. And it's one of the best things you could do for your um for your marriage so on and so forth so i sit down my thousand point reformed calvinist pastor at the time and our church is super uber duper reformed and i say hey listen um shouldn't these shouldn't the theology transition to people actually moving the needle and becoming more sanctified, becoming more disciplined, uh, aligning more with the Proverbs of, of what the scripture teaches about money. Shouldn't that be a thing that we do as a church? Other churches are teaching FPU. Can we do FPU? And my pastor at the time told me, we don't need another program. People don't need another program to tell them how to manage their money. People don't need another program to tell them how to be more disciplined. People don't need another program. They just need to th catch this. Catch this. And get this may be a caricature of the reform community, but this is literally what he told me. They just need to preach the gospel to themselves. And I was like, what? I love the gospel. Like the gospel is the good news. I love it. But you mean to tell me that the solution to, to me and my wife's multi-generational poverty is that we just need to get up every morning, look in the mirror, and just preach the gospel to ourselves. We don't need to learn how to ma manage a, a, a checkbook. We don't need to learn how to get on a budget. We don't need to learn how to save. We don't need to le learn how to live on less than we make. We don't need to develop scarce skills to increase our, 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 our revenue and, and increase our value in the markets. We don't need to learn any of that. We just need to look in the mirror and preach the gospel to ourselves. Right. And this was the sort of stuff that was coming out of the reform people I had access with. Right. The reform people I've had access with. Maybe not all reform people believe this. Maybe there's reform people that are really about showing the practical side of the gospel being transformed. And that's all I was asking for is like, hey, if we're justified by grace through faith, shouldn't the church have some role in us being sanctified to live this new life and that incorporates our finances, that incorporates learning how to communicate. That, of course, and by the way, I wasn't saying you go do this, Pastor. I'm saying I'll do it. I'll teach the FPU course. We were about halfway through this point. Again, I'm not co-signing everything Dave Ramsey's ever done, but we were about halfway through this, and that was that was like the the, the thing. And the, guess what happened? I'm gonna tell you guys what happened. The pastor, the reform pastor, went on. He planted a, a small church. Right? There's still about 175 to 100 people till this day, right? Love them to death, still see them, it's still all love. And I ended up going on staff a couple years later, and me and my wife took over 500 people through the FPU course, paid off over a million dollars in debt as a church, collectively, everybody. People saved over a half a million dollars in their emergency funds, 
right? And it was one of the best things we ever did. It was one of the best things that our church ever did. It was one of the best things that people till this day, we have so many close relationships because we took people through something. And, and, and we were like, we, we had actually never even taken FP. We were just listening to the podcast and got trained in doing it, right? So what role does the church play in the practical side of teaching people how to behave like competent, godly men and women in every area of their lives, not just knowledge of the gospel, which the gospel is vastly important. That is the crux, but the gospel should compel you to live different, right? It should be different. You should look different. Your finances should look different. Your life should look different. Rachel said, most don't know the gospel. That wasn't our church, Rachel. We knew the gospel. We were going through the the books in the Bible verse by verse. Our church knew the gospel very well. Yet our church, the folks that knew the gospel the best, were still living paycheck to paycheck, still struggling, still addicted to pills, Percocets, still rocky marriages, still all kinds of debauchery. And a lot of those folks moved on to the small reform church and still continued having issues in their marriages. And the the the, and the, the prescription every single time was preach the gospel. You just got to preach the gospel to yourself more. Ah, no, the gospel should also be communicated on how it's supposed to impact you. So no, our church knew the gospel. Maybe people in other mega churches churches don't know the gospel, can't speak on every church everywhere, but our church absolutely knew the gospel. It just wasn't being applied in a practical sense. And when that was presented to a reformed thousand point Calvinist, uh, I kind of got scoffed and laughed out of the room. And, you know, then he moved on and God did amazing things with a practical application implication of this. So let's keep going. I think people are coming to your church because it's like the evangelical equivalent of wine tasting. I think that they're like, oh, the way that Matt, the way that, the way that. <laughs> the evangelical equivalent of wine tasting. That's good. The way that Matt brings that the word, so there's funny. just nothing like that. There's just nothing like it. And yeah. I think I think you are probably seeing some people wonder Christ, but I honestly wonder if some of it isn't you're just seeing people baptized who grew up in a church where they didn't em- emphasize baptism, but they're probably already saved, and they're coming for fine, fine Bible teaching. I want to hear you speak to that. Dude. Well, I, I think there are there are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think we see quite a bit of, of conversion among what, what I, I don't know how we want to label it. Um, the, so I got to baptize my daughter last weekend. The, the girl in the, that was baptized in front of her was... Um, you know, coming out of homosexual background, um, her church background was, was her being sexually abused by her deacon. Right, exception and is so, an exception. But, but I can go through got some stories like those, that. Hundreds of those. So just as many of those as I, I grew up in church and didn't hear the Bible. So um, I, I want to, as best I can, um, attack. Um, we're here for Matt. Um, and, and so I, no, I we're, I'm, I'm on the, we're here for the Bible connoisseur. I like sure. the way you teach the Bible. If Kay Arthur was here, I'd go to her church. Yeah. I'm talking about well, that. But I think there's enough, I, I think there's enough edge to me to, to get the kind of staunch reformed button down guy to be, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to have uh, something to drink. I'm going to say the word hell occasionally as an adjective. I'm going to, you know, and that they, they tend to look upon those things. Pastor Matt just say he drinks alcohol. Uh Oh, with great frustration. So you're trying to break down some of the legalism associated yeah. with Bible teaching. But look, by, by Chandler's own admission, all right, I heard you one time or early on when I first started getting introduced to your stuff, which I love. I'm not just throwing that out there. I love his stuff. Yeah. He is, everything I was doing in that thing, you know, feed me, bless me, man, push back the high chair and get involved and start and start seeking God, not in a sense of what's in it for you, but in a sense of what you can give back to him and live your life in this way. You understand, you, you hate that every bit as much as I do. And you might come at it from a different way in how you run those people off, but that's what you described. And so we need this again. I think this would be so fire if there was something like this for Christian YouTubers to come together and have these conversations face to face. I've I've honestly tried behind the scenes, not over virtual, but like, let's get people in a room together. But I really think that if you hear what both of them said, they basically said the same thing. We don't want people just coming for informational stuff that's not going to lead to transformational stuff. How we do it at this time seems more so like a distinction of methodology, right? So Fardik is like, you aren't preaching enough depth in preparing people for the hard parts of life. And Fardik is saying, hey, you, Chandler, are also creating this false dichotomy between doctrine and evangelism, right? So uh, I, th- I think it's really interesting. I also am curious from a socioeconomic standpoint like if the like if the church had never introduced me and my wife to the idea of biblical financial stewardship i don't know where i would be like i really mean that like we did not have resources of 
wealthy family individuals that were crushing with money. We didn't have access. So the church was literally our gateway in many of the areas that by the grace of God, I'm successful today. It's because of the local church. It's because of either people I met in the local church or because the church are letting me run the soundboard and then letting me run the video setup and letting me run. Right. And so I think so many of these things were as a byproduct of the local church. And I'm not saying the local church needs to exist just to equip and empower people to change their socioeconomic background. But um, I think there is something to that, that maybe if you're coming from uh, a background where money is never an issue for you, you've never worried about money, your family's never worried about money, you've never thought about career, you've never thought about not, you know, not being able to make rent, not being able to eat. These were our realities as a young couple uh, because we just weren't equipped, we weren't trained. We both came from broken families, uh, single parent households. My my wife was, you know, in the foster care system for a while. So a lot of these things I think are are helpful when they're coming from the church. And when they're not, I, w- I wonder how much of the socioeconomic side plays into this where, yeah, in, a, in an ideal situation, like my son is not going to have to learn this stuff from church because he's going to be brought up by parents very early on that explain to him how money works, how giving works, how work connects to earning money, potential, all these different things. I'm, and again, that's saying that's it's what it's all about but i'm just saying that's a lot of folks are out here are struggling with these things and not wanting to end up in the same cycles that their families have been in generationally and if we're talking about the the quote-unquote fine t- fine wine of church well it's interesting i mean critics background your musician worship leader artist so he's going to play to his strengths matt isn't an artist i mean his shirt no, that's true <laughs> matt apparently almost was going to become an attorney and um, completely had a different change of trajectory in his life and became a pastor. So that that probably also speaks to kind of the way he's approaching stuff. No, that's not offensive to me. He's an athlete. He's an, he, I've known Matt for years. Every shirt has a collar. He wears a polo, and he looks like an extra from a 1950 sitcom. He just does. You know? Watch, 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 yo, watch Matt slay Driscoll right here with this one-liner. Listen. Until a couple of years ago, Driscoll was wearing a choker. So I'm just going to... It's a necklace. No, it's an inch neck. When I wear jeans, they're skinny jeans. Just not because they're skinny, because I'm not. That's, that's, just, that's just how it works. So, I mean, part of it is you played your strengths. And part of it, too, is his church is only five years old. So he's going to have a lot of young converts. And, you know, if he ends up having brain cancer, that's going to affect the way he teaches the Bible. That's right. Yeah, I do remember Matt Chandler having brain cancer. That's crazy. As his people age, he's going to have to hit certain issues. Right now, it's all weddings, not funerals. Right. I mean, you know, he's serving the people he's got, and he'll change as the church requires. All right, well, another one of you guys? Uh, I, without, I don't know either one of these guys that well we've just met, but as I listen to Stephen, it seems to me he probably has an evangelistic gift in his life. And okay. Matt may not, and that's not better or worse, it's just different. And sometimes I think when you're an evangelist, and that's my gift mix as well, you know, I need to swing more toward the discipline of Bible exposition illustrations come easily uh you know it's so interesting to hear Greg Laurie says that. He says, because his gifting is evangelism, I need to sway towards the discipline of Bible exposition. He's talking about verse by verse teaching, right? The illustrations, all that stuff come interesting. It's so interesting to hear Greg Laurie, who's a massive out here in California, I believe he, that they do the big crusades and all that stuff. So that's really interesting. There's over 700 churches in Charlotte, and God did not call me there to create a boutique that would serve the needs of the people who aren't being perfectly served, who only like 97% of what their current church has to offer. I came to Charlotte to see a city. He's speaking against a lot of the, we call this church hopper consumerism at the time. Let me find the perfect church to serve my needs. A lot of young folks didn't want to plug into churches and serve, so they'd go to a Saturday night service here, a Sunday morning here, a Sunday night here, and a Bible study at a different church, and they'd be a part of four different churches. This was a thing that was happening back then, because remember, this is before you could pull up any type of teaching you wanted on your phone whenever you felt like it, right? And so Ferdinand was saying, yeah, we're not really into that. I'd rather have get, pe- get people plugged in and get serving and start being a part of the church. Turned upside down to see some lost people saved, to see the kingdom of God built and extended and expanded. And I'm going to always, in terms of context, tilt the field toward 
my kid's t-ball coach who just lost his daughter six months ago and doesn't know the Lord. I've been inviting him for five months. And you know what? I've trained my church to bring those people with them every single weekend. So when they step out and they risk everything to say to their neighbor, to say to their friend, to say to their family member, come to church with me, I'm going to put it in a way that that person has the opportunity to respond to the gospel. It's important to me. My content is going to be biblical. I have a mandate to be biblical, to preach the word, be instant in season and out. That's very important to me. And I don't always do it perfectly, but I always do it with all of my heart. But I'm going to, in my mind, when I'm preparing that sermon, I'm going to picture my kid's t-ball coach. I'm going to picture that guy not having a clue what I'm talking about. And I'm going to start with an entry point that helps him understand what the gospel is. All right, David Platts, a Bible teacher, very gifted, uh, growing church. Uh, your thoughts on the tug of war between evangelism and... Uh... Look at the young David Platt here, man. These guys look, uh, everybody looks so different except for Matt Chandler, who looks exactly the same. Uh, biblical instruction in okay. Sunday. Obviously, we all, obviously all want the same thing. I think, though... If we're not careful, we can become too dependent in our evangelistic strategy on what happens on that Sunday morning to bring people to Christ. When I look at the, I think it's far more effective than bringing as many lost people as they can to hear me. I think it's far more effective for me to send out thousands of people every week who have the Holy Spirit of God in them, mm. who have the ability to share the gospel with people that I'll never meet in context that I'll never go. Like that's where evangelism needs to be happening in the church primarily. It doesn't need to be primarily dependent on me. I don't. I don't think. I think it's it good. He says, "Hey, equip the, the church." Uh, teach them the gospel and then send the church back out into the communities and they do the evangelizing and then the the, the Sunday morning church kind of becomes more of a, of, a, of, a, of a halftime event where we get together we refuel we, we, we get we get re-energized right and then you go back out on the field that's that's an interesting parallel but Matt Matt wants the same thing Matt wants yeah. the same thing I just think it's, it's not either or I think it's let me, let me let me tie something though um, and he says rightly we've got to train our people to be able to share the gospel without us it's not all about us at the same time you say well the pulpit is I don't know if you said the rudder of the church but something to that it, it drives it, it drives the church um, if I am not faithfully week after week after week speaking to people far from God in the gathering that is the worship of Jesus that is all about the gospel of Christ how in the world is the guy who has a t-ball coach who doesn't know Christ going to be able to model something that I don't model so then I say it's not only the weekend but if I'm not starting with the weekend to say we are going to reach people far from God through the preaching of the gospel on the weekend and it's primary how will it be primary in someone else's life the way I'm going to get them engaged and how in the world do we think these lost people are showing up at our church it's through our people rubbing shoulders as you described and, and living a life that, 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 that makes the person want to respond. Uh, evaluate this statement. I'm primarily speaking to Christians when I preach. Matt? Uh, I would say that I am primarily speaking to Christians when I preach with a view that there are lost people there. As a creative, let me tell you, uh, there's a lot of us that have struggled with this statement. And I think if you are a Christian creative, if you are in ministry, if you're an artist, YouTuber, odds are that's what it is. I'm primarily speaking to Christians when I preach, right? When, when, I'm, when I'm speaking if your positioning is that. Here, you see Furtick kind of struggle with this a little bit. I would say that I am primarily speaking to Christians when I... Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> do it. No, no, if you don't agree with that, say, no, I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking of lost people, Christians, listen in. If I preach for 45 minutes, I am going to describe in that 45 minutes the character of a Christian or the action that this, this is calling for, what God's trying to do in our lives, but I'm going to do it in a context that is primarily geared toward the person who is outside and trying to bring them inside, and I am going to give preference to them in the way I present my message. So, so preach it's opposite in, it in how we prepare, because I'm preparing, okay, this is what the Word of God says for the saints. Here are going to be the objections and issues that a lost man or woman has with this. Let me address these things while I, I teach this. That's what I do. Okay, I, it sounded like you were saying you kind of start with what are the object, objections and then go to. No, no, I, no, got, no, I, got, no, no I got this. I got this. Preaching to Christians with a... a in the back of my mind all the time as non-believers yeah. and I'm going to get the gospel in there and preaching to lost people but remembering that I love and care for the people that are in my church I'm going to have something to say to them too while I'm doing it those are two very different ways of doing it that's not the same thing what I said is I'm preaching to lost people and I care about the, my church too I'm saying my church exists for the mission of God in the world and I am going to equip them Ephesians 4 for that ministry and I'm going to empower them with the word of God. And so if I'm describing, in Christ you are more than a conqueror, in Christ you are, and I'm really going for it, and I'm sweating, I'm talking about the condition of a Christian. But I'm going to explain that in a way that someone who is outside knows how they can get in on some of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to constantly have them in my mind in my preparation. But I'm not preaching a sermon that a Christian can't relate to. I'm not talking for 40 minutes about how to become a Christian. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, if you're into this, here's something you can try this week. No. That was a good, in terms of the distinction, when you hear the distinction, it sounds like it was a distinction 
of methodology, right? This is this is where kind of the, the crux of it came down to. For, you know, Chandler saying, "I'm preaching to Christians," and I consider the non the non Christian in the room. Ferdick is not saying that; he's saying something different, but he still acknowledges that he's preaching to Christians. Now, at the time. That sounds like a methodology distinction. It's probably drifted since then, right? If, if we're going to be honest. Here's where I think this entire thing kind of comes down to. I think primarily if we are talking about the Sunday morning church, the gathering, the local ecclesia, that does not exist for the non-Christian, okay? Then it doesn't mean that you can't make that warm and welcoming to the non-Christian. It's that's just not what it is. If it, it, it's to build up the saints, it's to gather together, it's to be in worship of God. Now, if we're doing an outreach, if we're doing a food drive, if we're doing a concert, if we're doing a, a skate tournament, if we're right, those are evangelistic outreach events, and we would package those and probably preach at those different than we would at a Sunday morning gathering because the gathering is to what corporate worship there's specific sacraments communion happens at the gathering right and so if your church kind of leans towards what we exist to speak primarily to non-christians or however he phrased that is the logical conclusion of this i'm going to make it so palatable that maybe over time it drifts into a very watered down version where hell isn't talked about sin isn't talked about the word repentance is intentionally not used so on and so forth and then that can not always but can and usually does become an incomplete gospel because the gospel is good news god created people and it was good bad news genesis 3 sin enters original sin uh, good news jesus comes on a rescue mission lives the life we couldn't live dies the death we should have died good news bad news good news if it's just good news good news because you just want to, you know, get get the non-Christian in on some of this. As Frederick says, ah, does that become a little problematic? I think the entire discussion about this is, in a way, a false dichotomy. I don't think you have to choose speaking relevantly, being culturally relevant to the non-Christian, or providing depth and equipping the Christian for some of the more tough things that may come their way, some of the more deeper concepts that you need to understand about the glory of God, about how wicked people could be. I don't think it's an either or. And you know who exemplified this? And some of you guys are going to hate me for this, but that's okay. Come for me. Who wrote a whole book about this is actually uh, someone that wasn't at this. Maybe they should have been. Andy Stanley wrote a whole book called Deep and Wide. Deep versus wide is a false dichotomy, and he put together an entire package of how to communicate depth in your messages while also making the messages accessible to people that are far from God. So I think a lot of this is kind of a, a, a false dichotomy. I think this was a lot of methodology, but I am curious from you guys, do you guys think that this kind of led elevation down the path they went down, which is uh, a very pragmatic, we want to reach as many people as possible, and then the the theology kind of drifts over time to make it very man-centered, right? Is that what happened there? Or do you think something else happened there? Um, and, and this is totally unrelated, right? Because I t I'll tell you something, you guys aren't going to like this. Stephen Furtick, in this video, as much as I, I love the idea of reaching people far from God, as, as much as I love the idea of the church being on mission, Stephen Furtick, and this, this, this kills me, he, sounds, uh, he sounded a lot like Christian rappers who wanted to be secular rappers, and so they were under the delusion, like, like oh, my audience isn't mainly Christian, right? Like, like, and you say that, and then what happens is you start making music that kind of removes the edge, which is the gospel in a lot of Christian rappers' music, and then we saw the same or similar drift happen in Christian hip-hop, and then people are like, what is this? This is indistinguishable. It's just, it's just secular music without profanity in it. It just, it's, it's an alternative. It's not the antidote, right? Uh, is that what happened? Is, 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 is Elevation Church an alternative to Tony Robbins, or is it the actual antidote for our sin? You know what I'm saying? For the sin that we're dealing with, like, it's, it's a good question, right? It's a good, it's a good tension to have. This vaguely reminds me of a guy who, you know, it's almost like when someone is kind of edgy. For now, eventually, sometimes they end up leading in so far gone, right? Like the, the, the same example you use with the Christian rappers who want to reach a non-Christian audience and then they end up just making non-Christian music, 
right? So there was this microdosing gentleman, right? And he was a Christian and uh, he would microdose to mar- marijuana. And so he had a whole company. And this is a few years ago, me and Russo were like, yo, this guy's cool. Maybe there's this alternative where it can be used like a little breath mint or like uh, an ibuprofen, but without the drugs. And, and so it was a very interesting scenario. And then fast forward a few years later, he's like, on shrooms and has like new age getaways in, in, in the woods. And it's, it's the same sort of like, you know, verdict really cool years ago. And it sounds really edgy and it sounds like he's reaching a lot of people. And at the end of the day, it's just a watered down new age motivational sermon. Wow. What a, what a great parallel, man. Yeah. Because that, yeah, this is like, we're on this new cup, uh, on this new frontier of, you know, uh, cannabis being allowed in church. Uh, and uh, is it, oh, where's the line at? Oh, yeah, you don't smoke it, you might, right? And then all of a sudden, yeah, we, we, we checked out this dude not so long ago. He will remain anonymous for this video. And boy, was he far gone. Yeah, yeah, it was, I was like, is this the same, is this the same guy? Here's, here's the thing. We should never drift away or 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 be afraid of or think it's not prog- pragmatic to preach this simple gospel not a gospel uh bent towards a methodology not a gospel bent on a, a, a theology even right like if whenever you preach the gospel you just put a lot of reform sauce on it right and it just becomes all about predestination like ah you get your principles but just the simple gospel man God created us. It was good. Genesis 3, we fell. We all fall short because of the original sin of Adam. We all fall short because of some of our own decisions. And we can't stand in 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 a whole in, in, in front of a holy God because God is holy. He is different. And a good judge has to judge sin. And therefore, G sends Jesus. And before Jesus, people used to have to do these offerings and sacrifices. Jesus came as the ultimate sacrifice. If we place our faith in Jesus, we will be born again. Get new hearts, get new lives, and repent of. Of your sin, change your mind about your sin. That there is a real potential of eternity apart from God. Like, and so, so I think we remove some of these things, and we don't when we lessen. It, and it's just like I don't. Here's the thing, and this might be this might be me being uber optimistic, Zach. And you can push back if you want to. I don't think if fill in the blank of your favorite mega church pastor, whether that's a uh, uh, verdict, whether that's. Joel Olstein, even if these dudes started showing up this Sunday mornings and all of a sudden they started talking about repentance and all of a sudden they started talking about hell and all of a sudden they started talking about the gospel and sin. I don't think that people would stop listening to them because of this. Maybe they would, but I don't I don't think so. Why? Because there's massive churches that preach these things and it's about the presentation of the message and not omitting certain things from the message to make it more palatable, right? Like, I don't know if that's making sense, Zach. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like the, it's the false dichotomy of, oh, I need to make it watered down so that people really enjoy it. But it's like, but then explain Matt Chandler. This is a very flawed metaphor. So forgive me. I might clip this out, but it reminds me my fitness pursuit of like, man, I'm overweight. I want to lose some weight. I want to build some muscle. And then you start looking at guys on Instagram And you don't understand that what you're seeing on Instagram is a distorted view of reality. Okay. When you're, if if you want to get fit, don't look at the guys on Instagram because most of those guys are are on steroids. Most of those guys have built so much muscle that they have flexibility in their diet. So they can say, just eat two pounds of meat a day and have all the ice cream you want. Well, yeah, bud, because you took testosterone and you took other stuff and you built your body to have a gajillion pounds more muscle. The average person needs the bad news that if you're going to transform your body, bud, you got to change your eating champ. You're eating trash. It's so bad for you. You need to cut out the junk. You need to cut out the bad stuff. There's some probable internal things you need to deal with. Why you're choosing the terrible food that you're choosing. Why are you doing this? Right. And you got to replace those foods and you, right. You got, you got to change your mind about food. Got to change your mind about fitness. You got to. And so what, what happens is we just get one side of it. It's like, yeah, you know, just buy this program. And if you buy this program, you're going to look like me, right? And it's like, wait a minute, bud. Ah, uh, you're on steroids. And you don't really have to do the thing that the that, that, that is applicable to all people. It's like an omitted version of the reality of the situation. It's, it's a very flawed metaphor, right? Because we're saved by grace through faith and not works. And a lot of what we do with fitness is about works and mentality. But it, but, but it is omitting certain facts that I think often the times will set people up for failure if you don't tell them the truth fam in life 
If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. If you do what is hard, your life will be easy, right? That's how a lot of stuff. And Jesus says something similar. Pick up your cross. Got to die to yourself. Got to follow me. Got to lay down your life. You got to choose the hard road because the road to destruction is wide and many are on it, you know? And so, again, very flawed metaphor, but that my brain kind of thinks in that. Zach, what do you think? You can push back on this if you want to. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Someone uh, commented and said, isn't it unfair to assume that the edgy person will eventually uh, slip away or something, and I don't think that's what we're saying. What we're saying is is the hindsight is twenty twenty. So you fast forward ten years later, and you see that okay, some of, some of these edgy people, more so than not, are the ones that end up slipping away or, or doing some crazy stuff, or the sermons get watered down, or now it's like some wild stuff. So I, I don't think. What, what do you think is that balance between? Uh, having some edge, you know, a lot of people, Rusan would say that like you're edgy with your content and stuff, especially compared to other people online. So what is that balance between being edgy and being, uh, yeah, like towing that line, but then also not being open to going down a slippery slope? I would say one, not omitting some of the hard truth, right? So I think one, not omitting two, I think it's mad corny when people try to be edgy. Some of you guys think I come on and I try to do things on this channel. I really don't. Like, you guys gotta ask Zach, like, ask my family, ask anybody who knows me. I'm really this guy all the time. Like, I'm really on the same energy. I've been intentional about being congruent and, and, and having integrity. And by integrity, I just mean being the same person. So I think when somebody's trying to be edgy or trying to be cool or trying to be relevant, I think that's genuinely cheesy in my opinion, right? So I think in if you're if if you are that, if you are the guy that you just got a specific eye for detail with cameras and angles and aesthetic. Be that guy, right? And 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 then it comes out as, as an overflow. If you're not that guy, don't try to be that guy, right? And so I think in, in all of that, be who you are. Like, be who you are. Some of us, man, we have a natural predisposition to liking art and music and color schemes and aesthetic and all those different things. And that's just who we are. It's, I'm not trying. I don't think a lot of these guys that, that are accused of, like, being the cool pastor are trying to be the cool pastor. I think they just are being what they are. Some of them are, and you can kind of tell. But I think it's, it's is this coming from an overflow? Now, when you're trying and you're intentionally putting bravado on stuff, when you're intentionally putting a little extra sauce on it, yes, I think that could get problematic. And I think we saw that. I think that the, the flesh does have to be in check. I think when it's about you and you flexing and how cool you are, right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really into that, right? So I don't know where that line is, um, but we do have to look at history and say, well, if you're going to have a massive church, how is that going to play out in the grand scheme of things, are you going to create those checks and balances? Are you going to have elders? Are you going to have people that could call you up, tell you you need to sit down, right? Are you going to have those parameters so that you can continue flourishing and, and thriving? Because the issue isn't the size of the church. Like the issue is the lack of accountability and the limitless access to power that many of these mega church pastors eventually drift into. And you heard it all over the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Those of you guys that listen to it, I don't think Driscoll set out to be a bad guy initially. I think the power just kind of got to him, unfortunately. You know, and and, and, think, and I, unfortunately, I think we're seeing the same thing uh, potentially play out with obviously Hillsong New York, and now there's the massive thing with international investigation on Hillsong Global. I think we're unfortunately going to see some of the same stuff come out of Elevation Church with the way they're, they're structured and how insulated Furtick is and how there's nobody there to kind of push him, push back on him and challenge him on stuff. I think this stuff is an overflow, not of quote-unquote being edgy, but omitting certain things and creating systems and institutions that allow dysfunction to thrive and flourish. And I don't want to see that because I, going full circle, I think a lot of this is a false dichotomy. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's an and both. I think there's a time to be intentional, to do outreach and reach people far from God. I don't think you craft your Sunday morning experience to do that. Uh, I want to hear from you guys. What elephant room session do you want to see me do next? Okay, there's some. There's a lot of good ones. There's T.D. Jakes versus Mark Driscoll. What, what other ones you guys want to see me discuss? Leave that in the comment section. If you guys found value from this, you want to go the extra mile, be sure to consider partnering with us on Patreon. It's $10 a month, and that really does go a long way. In case a video like this 
you know, has to come down. We could put it on Patreon. People can watch it there. I'm going to go back and, and, and kind of chop down a lot of this to make sure that it's not, uh, you know, uh, using too much of their clips. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you so much for being here. And we are out. Peace. Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. Check out the links in the description for some free resources, including a free How to Study the Bible course and a free Master My Habits course that I put together with my Christian therapist. Also, if you want to see what happened after this, when Stephen Furtick invited Matt Chandler to preach at his church for their Code Orange Revival and my reaction to that sermon, take a look right here. All right?